Hey, Mini Wargamers, welcome to another Machine Shop with Ash. Uh, this is my weekly show about war games and war gamers. If you've never watched it before, I usually pick a topic, something you guys have either sparked in my brain um, or that we've discussed in the comments or in pre or, like, previous or prior Machine Shops, um, and I expand on it, evangelize on it, editorialize on it, whatever the case may be. Um, so this week, we are going to talk about army list writing. This is something that we get all the time in the comments, or as messages, or as emails. What do you think I should do to blah, X, Y, Z for an army list? And people always want to do something different with an army list. They want to write an army list themed to some piece of background or story they have. They want to write an army list that's competitive in X or Y format. Um, or they want to do all of those things together. That's the hardest one. How can I have a fluffy, background-driven Space Marine army that's also hyper-competitive and super, uh, you know, um, how can I say, winny in this certain format, like the Nova Open or um, the, uh, what is it, the independent uh, tournament format or whatever it is, the ITC. Independent Tournament Committee? Committee? Something like that? ITC. The ITC format. It's a big, big popular 40K and fantasy format. Um, so I thought I'd take a stab at talking about how to write an army list. I'm not going to give you guys individual army lists. What I'm really going to do is talk about a series of questions. What would you want to ask yourself if you're going to attack those two things? I'm going to divide this machine shop into two. One, it's about the background, the story, the imagery, the theme. It doesn't apply to any given game system. We could apply this just as easily to Fantasy as to 40K, as to Malifaux, as to War Machine, as to Infinity, as to... I don't know, Hell Dorado, whatever you want to do, whatever our game or army you want to have, um, I'm sure there's a way for you to build a narrative into it or build some type of story into it. Um, and then vice versa, we're going to talk a little bit about how would you do uh, the competitive side of things. What kind of questions should you ask yourself when you're writing an army list in order to make it competitive? At the end, I may attempt to talk about how you can cross those two things together um, because I do think it's possible to have competitive lists that you also build background story around. You might have to do a little shoehorning to get it there, um, especially if you're picking pre-made bits of background, story, fluff, whatever it is. If you're taking something that's already in existence, you want to make it hyper-competitive, you might have to do a little bending of the story or a little bit of uh, commission by omission in order to, uh, to get the, the details right or get it to be as, let's say, powerful on the table as you want it to be. So, without further ado, let's talk about how to write an army list your way. So in this case, when I say destination, what I mean is victory. If getting to victory isn't the most important thing to you, if having something driven by the narrative, the fluff, the story, is the most important goal for you when you are writing an army list, then this is probably the section for you. This is where we talk about how do you incorporate things um, and, and story and your idea and have it represented on the battlefield. So here's the steps you would have to do. First one, let's look at this as if you were building a historical army. So let's think about this from the background of you are now capturing something that existed for real. Even if it's in your imagination right now, let's just shift our brains and decide this thing really happened. So, this army is a real formation. Why is it important that we shift our brains that way? Well, because you gotta get the details right. If you have a story, if you have a narrative, if you have a piece of background in your head, um, so for instance, let's say I wanted to build a Warhammer 40K army around the Horus Heresy. And this would be really important. Um, when would I want to put it to be in the Horus Heresy? Well, what, what do you mean? Ash 30K, it's the Horus Heresy. Oh, the armies in the Horus Heresy didn't really stay the same. Um, if you were to build a pre uh, uh, conclave at Nakia Horus Heresy army, then you might have a Librarius in your Space Marine Legion. So you might have librarians actively going around and doing things, a psychic um, sort of cadre inside the Space Marine Legion. If it's post the Conclave of Nikea, when the Emperor has banned psychics and all the legions, then you wouldn't, unless you're playing certain legions and they're being naughty and they're still using psychic powers like the Thousand Suns, and actually technically the Space Wolves. Even their um, Rune Priests are technically using psychic powers in defiance of the Treaty of Nikea, which is, you know, a little bit, uh, how would you put it? Uh, 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 I don't want to say irresponsible, I'm going to say uh, hypocritical considering they destroy Prospero because of the use of psychers and they're using psychers all of their own. Uh, so yeah, kind of a big deal um, that you have to decide when and how this army is taking place. So if, there, if you are picking a piece of background that already exists, let's say you are going to do the Drakenhof Templars in Warhammer Fantasy, the Drakenhof Templars. Well, when are we talking about the Drakenhof Templars? Are we talking about when Sylvania was still a province in the Warhammer world and they were an order of knights? 
um, that was part of the empire and served the electric count? Or are we talking post Vlad's takeover of Sylvania when they are all turned into vampires and they're an evil cadre basically of vampiric or undead knights? Kind of an important detail, right? So you have to treat this army when you're writing it from Blackhound point of view as if it is a period piece. You're writing a piece of history and if you're pulling fluff from somewhere else, if you're not creating the background for yourself, then you need to get the details right because that's where the story really falls into place. So first, what are the details of the unit? Their style, their history, their markings, their beliefs. Um, this is something you need to research. So for instance, uh, let's go back to the Horus Heresy again. If we are talking about the Ultramarines, um, in current modern day, uh, sort of ultramarines lore, sergeants all have red helmets. They all have their helmets painted red. Little detail, you might, if you didn't really research the background and the markings and the, the stuff, you know, sort of the story around the ultramarines, decide that you're gonna paint your 30K uh, ultramarine army with all your sergeants with red helmets. Oh, that would be bad. Red helmets were only introduced after the destruction of Kalth. An enterprising sergeant uh, dealing in the theoreticals and the practicals uh, decided that he was going to dive into the theoretical, not do the thing the Codex that Gilliman was writing said he should do and fight in an unconventional manner in order to sort of get the word bearers off the ship that he had. And he was actually being censored at the time. He was a guy who was being put um, into basically the stocks. He was being told he was naughty bad because he had a penchant for doing this, for breaking the rules and fighting unconventionally. Roll the tape forward 10,000 years into today, that red helmet is no longer a mark of shame as it was for him, but actually a mark of respect and rank for sergeants in the Ultramarines chapter. So again, understanding how these guys look, what their markings are, how they're supposed to be um, you know, represented on the battlefield, well, that's gonna help us with our later steps. That's something you have to research. The next thing, it's about the characters, their personality, their styles, all of the things that go into making them unique. If you're gonna build a fluff or narrative-driven army, knowing about the people that you, you, you are building, right down to the sergeants, their personalities and how they act, that helps you in your modeling, that helps you in how you build guys. Uh, you might decide that you want, uh, if you have a story or you, uh, you're building a sergeant, a certain sergeant from a Black Library novel in your Space Marine Army, that you wanna give him running legs instead of standing legs. He's particularly aggressive, he's over the top. Um, same with your captain, your sergeants. However it is, the pose, the styling of your miniatures, if it's gonna evoke a story from two feet away on the table, you need to know the personalities and the sort of dogmas and beliefs of the miniatures that you're making. Um, so for instance, if you were to model Marius Lightdorf from, the, he's one of the Electric Counts, uh, the Mad Count, I believe of Averland, Averland? I think he's Averland. Mad Count of Averland, you'd want to model him look a little crazy. Maybe some bags under his eyes when you paint that guy. Not looking completely sane. Why? He's crazy, that's his story. Um, you know, having him equipped with kind of crazy looking knights or guys who are a little unhinged themselves, converting your knights to look a little bit different. Might actually add that little level of detail to your army that's really important. Um, now, for instance, you can do this in other things too. So. Uh, when I built my original Kator army for War Machine, I themed it all around the 5th Border Legion. So I have a green and red Kator army. They're all in sort of um, OD green. They look like T-34 tanks or Soviet tanks from the Second World War with little red accents as opposed to being predominantly red. Uh, my, my infantry also, lots of OD green, lots of grays, little bits of red as accents, but they, they look different because they are themed off of the Border Legions, the guys fighting on the edge of Kador, um, who are a little less ostentatious in their garb, and a little more reserved and willing to like fight you know, in camouflage and as a traditional sort of, traditional sort of military unit. Um, and that was a detail that I thought was important. And that brings me to putting it all together. When you are gonna build this army, if you've done this research and you've got your, your sort of your facts pulled together, you're treating this like it's a historical document, you're trying to get the details right, you know the characters, you know their, their details. When you actually go to building this army, when you physically put it together and start painting it, you need to make that come alive from two feet away in 1 43rd scale. Now that's hard, but that's where the sort of passion for doing this comes into it. If you're going to try and get the details right, then this is something you should enjoy. Building every model one at a time, fitting into you know whatever your standard point game or so your standard uh, point game size is uh, a snapshot of that army so for instance uh, if gaming isn't a concern and you're really into let's say again we'll use space marines as an example a certain battle company from a certain uh, a certain space marine chapter, then having your formation sizes right, your squad sizes right, becomes really important. Each of those squads having a transport becomes really important. If you're trying to fight, you're trying to build a demi company, 
which is a half company led by one of the staff, so not necessarily led by a captain, but led by something like a, uh, a reclusium command squad. So one of the chaplains has been given a demi company and gone off to do something, or a member of the librarius. Then having those three tactical squads, one assault squad, one devastator squad, if it's a codex chapter, trying to fit that into exactly 1500 points, that tells a story in and of itself. That's an important detail. So, so that's the last step is, you need to bring all this stuff together, try and fit it into the point size game that you want to play, and then model it all out and have it be something that's recognizably a story from a certain distance away on the table. Um, there's lots of great ways you can do this. Display boards can help you tell a story. Uh, you can use um, other enemy models mounted on that display board to really have it evoke a scene. Uh, you can do uh, dioramas as part of your army display, so having little vignettes that your miniatures sit into to try and give life to the story that you're trying to evoke. Um, these are all things from the modeling point of view that can help you to really evoke the sense that this is a fluff and narrative driven army. Now that might not be important to you though. That might be the thing that you care about personally and then showing it off you knowing the story might be more important than the people looking at the army knowing the story. So the display board, having it have a narrative attached to it, that might be important if you're going to a tournament and you want people to recognize, oh, it's X army from X story, from X period, from X point of view. Not so important if you're the person really that cares about that. Then you don't need to worry about the two foot away thing. You don't need to worry about lining your models up so they tell a story. But if that is important to you, if that's the level of detail you want to go into, then that's the last step. So there it is. There's how you would build the questions you would ask yourself. You know, what period is this set in? Uh, what are the, the details of the formation, the unit that I'm building? Um, what are the characters and the characteristics of those characters that are gonna be included in it? And then finally, how do I make all this jump off the table from two feet away? Um, and what are my resources and assets for doing so? Those are the questions that I would ask myself if I was building a narrative-driven army list. So let's take a look at game-driven. All right, so the questions you need to ask yourself when you're writing a gaming-driven army list, um, and these are, I think, in order of importance, if it were my, you know, my writing an army list. The first question is, how do you most commonly win? So to pick a game at random for an example, War Machine. How do you most commonly win at War Machine? Well, there's two ways you can most commonly win. You can win instantly by killing the opponent's Warcaster. That's maybe not the easiest way to achieve victory. The more surefire or more conservative way to achieve victory is to win on control points through scenarios. And everyone knows what eight scenarios there are in Steamroller 2015. Most of them involve being somewhere on the board while your opponent isn't. So either holding a flag, being in a zone, or potentially destroying an objective. Now, those are all positional and tactical ways of winning a game. And you typically have to be there for a certain period of time. So once you've identified that, and War Machine's a good example, because typically the, the ways to victory are very well known. There's eight scenarios plus killing the uh, opponent Warcaster in a given time. Um, they are not really subject to change unless you play in some kind of strange format. Those eight scenarios and that additional layer of complexity, which is assassination, are the known paths to victory. Those are the ways that you will be able to go and achieve your victory. So now the second question is, what are the most common ways my opponent typically stops me from winning? So now if you look at the flip side, not how do I go and achieve victory, but what does my opponent do to throw obstacles and roadblocks in the way? So now for instance in zone control, um, in War Machine, jamming up the zones, getting there first and holding you back so that you can't do anything, holding the line while he achieves uh, control points is the most common way that people will achieve victory. And you'll see that jamming, as it's called, or having a resource at the disposal to get into the zone and either push people off um, or stay there and not be able to be killed and run the clock down for the two turns it takes you to win are the most common paths to victory. Now, once you've identified those two things, how do I most commonly win? How, how is my opponent most commonly going to stop me to win? You can start to examine your resources. And in that context, what we're talking about is army list, right? So let's say in 40K, to use another parable, a lot of times you're looking at things like objective securing. So your, your path to victory is securing objectives. Your opponent's path to victory is securing objectives, right, as well. And how does he most commonly stop you? He destroys your units first that are able to trump objective securing. So, for instance, by, by prioritizing the units that you know will secure an objective over everyone else, things like troop choices, or things in Battleforge that have objective secured, um, which are troop choices in Battle, sorry, they're not separate things, it's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> you now have an equation for assessing your resources. So for instance, to give you a great example, when you assess resources in the Eldar army list, Eldar jet bikes don't look good on paper in and of themselves. So a, a minimum squad of Eldar jet bikes, three guys, 
I think they are 90 points for three of them. They have toughness four. They have some some fairly basic offensive capacity uh, with shuriken catapults. You can upgrade one to have a shuriken cannon out of three. Um, they are uh, three bullets armor set, like I said. They are jet bikes, so they can get a cover save if they go fast. And, and they don't look great on paper. They, they don't look like they're going to earn a bunch of victory points for you. But when you assess them on a scale of what can they do for me, they can secure an objective in a Battleforge mission. So they can go, and in the final turn, you can keep them out of line of sight for the entire game. In the final turn, they can turbo boost X number of inches and jam up and claim an objective at the end of the game. All of a sudden, their value becomes exponentially greater. And that leads us to the last step. What is undervalued in my army? What do I have that costs the, le the least to get me the most? So if you're rating things like mobility, the ability to objective secure, and decent survivability, especially on an Eldar scale, three plus armor save and toughness four is pretty high. Um, the Eldar jet bikes all of a sudden rate higher on those three things. They might not rate high on how much stuff can they kill if that was the scale you're using. That's not typically the way that you're gonna achieve victory in a game of Warhammer 40K. It's a way to achieve victory, but it's not the most common necessarily way of doing so through objective, um, you know, securing objectives and jamming up zones. Um, vice versa, things like uh, um, press gangers. They're a mercenary unit for the mercenary army in War Machine. They don't look fantastic on face value. Their offensive cap capabilities are fairly mediocre, but they have advanced deploy and tough. And what that means is they can get into a control area, control zone, and jam it up fairly reliably and hold it at the very least, if not take it, while the rest of the army comes in a second wave to push back whatever's there and hold the area. So what we're getting into now is resource management. When you look at your army list, and, and people use the term min-maxing, what I'm talking about is looking for the undervalued units, looking for the things in the army list that actually the game itself doesn't say or doesn't understand are as good as they are. Because they're being rated on one scale, but you're rating them on another scale because you understand what the, the, the methodology is to, to best try and get yourself to victory. So when you're army list writing, including a good mixture of those undervalued units or, or creating them in such a way that you pay the least point cost for the most. So for instance, um, if you have access to something, doesn't mean you should take it. So uh, to give you a great example, a Space Marine Sergeant and a Devastator Squad can take a Power Fist. But if all he's ever going to be doing is watching two guys with missile launchers shoot for the entire game, why would you buy him a power fist? And that's where we talk about creating value or, or making sure that you are minimizing your investment and maximizing your return. It's not a dirty word, min-maxing. If you're looking to build an effective army list that wins, it's the thing you need to do. Um, then understanding the first two questions, so how do I most commonly win and how does my opponent most commonly stop me from winning, uh, can become very, very important. To go back to my jetpack example, one of the most common ways that, uh, that your opponent stops you from winning is killing your objective secured stuff before, it, before the end of the game, before it gets to get there and jam stuff up that can hold objectives. Now, because those guys are so fast, they can just stay out of line of sight. They can stay behind a building uh, for the first five turns of the game and zip on in the final turn. That is that is an undervalued attribute, right? They are they are not, val if, if they win you a game, if a 90 point unit wins you a game, um, and that's 1 15th or less than 1 15th of your total army cost, then you have certainly paid, you've paid less than they are worth if they are actually winning you the game at that point on turn six. Um, and having two units of them just as a mobile reserve for the end of the game is something that I've seen a lot of Eldar players do because uh, they can be super handy in late game uh, or even just deciding to play late game. Uh, Likewise, in games of fantasy, having uh, fast units that can basically deny charges by being something like fast cavalry and get around the flank that are worth a ton of victory points. They're fairly undervalued. Um, you can take big units of them because they don't cost too, too much. And what they do is protect their victory points. They stay away from the enemy long enough that the enemy never actually gets to fight them. And that can be a huge advantage uh, in a game of Warhammer where maneuvering and facing are so hugely important. Um, it's why things like Chaos Chariots, being in the core slot, being able to do as many of them as you want, is a huge undervalue. They, they are very cheap for what they can do, for how many wounds they have, the armor save they have, and the slot that they represent in the army. If they were special choices, you probably never see them. But because they're a core choice, because you can max out them and take as many as you like, and you can take an unlimited amount, they become hugely valued in 8th edition fantasy. Of course, going forward, who knows? But in the current meta, in the current road to victory, they're very, very important. So there we go, so there's a list of questions that you would want to ask yourself um, when you were writing an army list in a competitive mindset. 
how do you most commonly win? How does your, most, uh, your opponent most commonly try to deny you victory? Um, and then as you evaluate resources, what are your assets? What are the things that you have that can achieve those, that can achieve the first thing while hopefully stopping your opponent from doing the second thing? And then what's undervalued? What's the ones where you get the most for the least? Your, your best investment, basically, uh, where you maximize your reward for the points that you're spending. Now, <clears throat> How do you put these two things together? Whoa, well, that's hard. Um, as I said earlier, it can be really, really difficult to blend these two things because you might, you might end up having to do things that contradict the narrative of your story uh, in order to achieve victory. So for instance, if you were taking a um, Beal Tan army, right? So you're taking an Eldar, I'm gonna use them as an example again because I've been using them for a lot of this. Um, Beal Tan in the background is a craft world in 40k. They are the warrior craft world. They are the ones who have the most amount of aspect warriors, um, and their army, the Sword Wind, is typically composed not of its citizen levy, but of dedicated soldiers, career soldiers, um, who've dedicated themselves to a warrior aspect, and they fight in that mentality. So, taking a unit of mobile reserve of guardians on jet bikes doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Why? Their citizen levy doesn't usually get themselves risked in combat. They're usually relying on their, their, their you know, warrior cast to actually go and wage war for them. So is it, a, is it a huge bend, including guardians in the army? No, but it will be the thing that if you are telling people that this is a themed Baeltan army, and you look down and see guardians, will make some eyebrows go, hmm, okay because you're making a concession basically on the story in, in lieu of taking something that's you know good basically on the road to victory. And you'll have to do that in lots of games. Um, so for instance in War Machine, it is probably the greatest mix and match uh, uh, game of all time because it has mercenaries, it has people from different sort of nations and creeds all fighting together. Uh, and, and you can often see uh, armies, so for instance there's a joke that uh, most Signar troops <laughs> come from the mercenary pool. And a lot of uh, Signar armies are very reliant on their casters, their warjacks, and then lots and lots of mercenary units and solos. It's not a huge joke. Um, it's hard to see the theme behind those uh, named units and mercenary units showing up and fighting for X or Y warcaster. But they're super good in the game, they're good in the road to victory, and you might not make an optimal list by taking things like even a theme force in War Machine. Some of the theme forces people don't consider them to be very good. Why? Because they are uh, restricting what you can take and, and cutting out some of those optimized units that allow you to get the most for your least and achieve victory in the best possible way. So I think the key to blending those two things together is you need to be flexible. You need to either drop some things that you think you absolutely must have for the sake of the story in the background, or include some things that you might not think actually fit there, or maybe, I don't know, model them in such a way that they should even if they don't. Uh, so for instance, um, if you wanted to include those self-same Eldar jet bikes, maybe modeling them as Exodite Rangers um, that have been hired to lead the Vanguard as opposed to modeling them as gar uh, Guardians and changing the background for those models a little bit but keeping their in-game effects and having them do the same. So you model a bunch of guys riding cold ones, you give them twinling shuriken catapults. They're visibly what they are supposed to be. No one's going to argue that they are, you know, a good stand-in basically for all our jet bikes, but you've changed the story around those models to try and fit what you're doing. Um, so that's the name of the game, is Compromise. So there you go, guys. There's my stab at advice on army list writing uh, from a narrative point of view, from a gaming point of view, and the concessions that you might have to make to bring them together and do them both at once. Um, so let's take a look at what's on my painting table for this week. So the painting table might not be too terribly exciting this week as I've been primarily working on scenery. Um, I got a couple of Bandua stackable buildings. Now these can be used either individually, sort of on the ground floor, or you can stack them to make buildings um, that are significantly higher. Uh, I have four of these guys. They all have cool lift off roofs, so you can go inside and see here. Um, they've been primarily painted on my airbrush. Uh, yeah, and they got some cool acrylic windows, ladders, bits and pieces like that. Um, I wanted some color in my Infinity City. Everything so far is pretty gray, so I added some greens and beiges to try and make things uh, a little more bright. So those are pretty cool. Um, I've also got a Bandua Tower, another one of the stackable buildings. Again, I did them in a different color, did them in green, uh, as opposed to in uh, more gray, just to sort of make things pop and have some more color. And I'm getting ready for the Infinity League I'll be running. Um, and to do so, I will be the Yu Ching player. So this is my 120 points of Yu Ching. I'll be playing for the first week of the league season. If you read ITS 2015, um, we'll be using the league rules from that. So I have a uh, Invincible HMG. I have a Gulang Skirmisher. I have three Zanshis. 
a uh, Celestial Guard and a Monk. They've just been airbrushed with my base colors. Um, and I'll be getting around to painting the rest of them relatively soon. If you see any missing arms, they're just sitting up here, basically being stuck into some white tack uh, as I get painting details on them. And then all their bases are right there, just airbrushed, and I'll do the details on them later. Uh, so there's my, my busted apart 120 points of Yu Ching that you'll see in the future in the new Infinity League that's coming up. You'll also notice I, I made a little army display section. Um, I had a 6x4 frontline gaming mat that I decided to chop up. Um, and make little army displays. So when you see armies being filmed in Studio B, which is my sort of like home studio, uh, they can be displayed on this, which is kind of nicer to look at than just putting them on old tablecloths. So there it is on the painting table for this week. All right, Miniware Gamers, so thanks again for watching this most recent episode of The Machine Shop. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, if you have an idea for Machine Shop, you want to talk about this one, um, or just chat about Wargaming in general, you can hit me up in the comments, either on YouTube, on the Mini Wargaming site, or on my own Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash out of the basement into the streets. Um, Facebook's usually the best way to get back to me or to reply to one of my comments on YouTube. It doesn't buzzes my phone, and I can actually see what you guys are saying, as opposed to having to go and scam and go and scam, and there's new stuff that I don't really see. Um, so those are the best two ways of doing it. Um, and of course, uh, this show is usually usually generated by you guys, by discussions that come up or talking points that happen based on the shows that we already have. Do so you have a great idea for a machine shop? Um, feel free to fire away uh, and, um, you know, sort of hit me up with what you'd like to discuss, talk about, or expand on the one we've already had, because a lot of times machine shops kind of roll into each other. So thanks again for watching The Machine Shop. Uh, for me here at Mini Wargaming, um, I appreciate you guys' viewership. We'll see you next time for more. Until then, have a great